Rams wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. suffered a left knee injury during the Super Bowl this past Sunday. The team is currently reporting that they suspect it is an ACL tear, but as of our time recording this right now, that is still unconfirmed. So we can have a quick look at the video here to just kind of break down what has happened with that injury. Looking at it through here, he tries to plant on his foot and then sort of immediately doesn't want to wait bear through that and then immediately comes off the field shortly after. So before we even really get into the finer details of what's happened during this injury, there's a couple factors that make us immediately think this is likely an ACL tear. First and foremost, it's that this was a non-contact injury. We know that about 70% of ACL tears occur by either a non-contact or minimal contact mechanism. So anytime we hear about a non-contact knee injury, ACL tends to be one of the first things we're thinking about. Number two is the playing surface. So SoFi Stadium in LA, where the Super Bowl was hosted, is an artificial turf field. And we know that injury occurrence on artificial turf tends to be significantly higher than what we see on natural grass surfaces. Uh, a study done by the NCAA a couple of years ago actually showed about a 30% increase in prevalence of non-contact knee injuries on artificial turf compared to natural grass fields, and in addition, a 1.6 times increase in ACL injuries specifically. And number three for this is we know that Odell Beckham Jr. had a left ACL tear in October of 2020. So knowing that there is a previous injury through there, despite the fact that he likely would have cleared all the necessary milestones to return to sport, there is still up to about a 20% incidence of re-tears, especially in athletic male populations. So before we get into the details of what actually happened during this injury, it's important to understand what an ACL is and what it does. So we're gonna pull this up on our anatomy app over here. And what you can see is the ACL runs from the outside of the thigh bone to the inside of the shin bone. Its primary purpose here is to create rotational and translational stability, which is a fancy way of essentially saying that it is trying to stop your shin from moving forward relative to your thigh or twisting inwards relative to the thigh. So you can see based on the setup through here that if you were to get an inwards twist or a lot of forward movement, that would put a lot of tension onto that ligament and can potentially cause a tear. So one of the best ways to demonstrate what your ACL actually does is to look at one of the assessment tools that we use to try and diagnose an ACL tear. There's a number of different ones, but this specifically is called the pivot shift test. So it's conducted by applying a fair bit of pressure through the foot, so to try to recreate some of the forces that you might have while you're weight bearing, while at the same time applying some of that inward rotation to the shin and a little bit of outside to inside pressure through the knee. So in a healthy knee, what you would see is not much movement of the shin relative to the thigh as they apply these pressures. And then as you bend and straighten the knee, it should be a relatively smooth movement. However, in an ACL deficient knee where it doesn't have that necessary stability, what we see here when that pressure is applied while the knee is straight, we get a little bit of that shift forward of the shin relative to the thigh. So you almost see it bulge past the knee, similar to what you might see on something like an anterior drawer or a Lockman's test. Additionally, as they move this from straightened to bent, in a healthy knee that should be a pretty smooth movement, but in an ACL deficient knee, what you get is this kind of large shift or clunk as they move it into flexion. And that's as a result of that shin moving further than it might typically and causing there to be excess tension on the iliotibial band, which causes it to kind of bounce back into place from there. So with an understanding of what an ACL deficient knee looks like on testing, we can come back to this clip and look at things a little bit closer to get a better understanding of what happened with this injury. So what we see here is as he's running across the field, all of his momentum is going forwards. He tries to plant his foot down into the turf, and this is one of those situations where we realize some of the dangers of using turf fields, because if this was natural grass, there would typically actually be a little bit of the slide with his foot to take a bit of that momentum down. But instead, because of his foot sticking in the turf, all of the momentum is still moving forward and kind of goes up towards his knee. So you can imagine that shin kind of moving forward with a fair bit of momentum. Additionally, he's kind of turned inwards away from that knee. So his center of mass is going to be fairly far inside that left knee, which is going to cause that knee to twist a little bit and potentially buckle into that valgus position or where your knee is kind of moving a little bit towards your midline. 
So that kind of puts it into that compromised position where ACL is going to have a lot of tension on it. The second clip actually is a really, really interesting one when you look at this from the front view. And what you can see is when he plants his foot, if you look closely, it's quite subtle, but his knee is actually, or rather his shin just below his knee, you can see it shift forward ever so slightly. And then as he proceeds through that bend in this movement, you kind of see it snap back, which really demonstrates that pivot shift mechanism that we just talked about. So based on what we've seen there, these are some of the things that are kind of causing us to assume that this is likely a re-tear of his ACL. Additionally is the fact that he went off to the medical tent and was ruled out of the game quite quickly after that, knowing that the best time to test for an ACL tear is immediately after the injury, before things have swollen up too much and you get a lot of guarding around there, it's likely that they tested his knee, found a lack of stability or a lot of pain, and said that this is likely an ACL tear and it wouldn't be safe for him to return to the game at that time. Interestingly enough, if we look at his previous injury back in October of 2020, the mechanism is very, very similar. So first and foremost, as we look at this, this is at Paul Brown Stadium in Cincinnati, which is another artificial turf field. So that's our first indicator there. Second, we can see it's another non-contact injury. So he has a small little push, but that's what we'd classify as minimal contact rather than him, him getting tackled right into the lower leg or anything of that sort. And it's the same kind of thing where he's all of his momentum is going forward. He tries to kind of rapidly plant that foot. Momentum is moving forward. And then you can see from this um, angle from behind, he actually gets that little buckle of the knee moving and rotating inwards, which again would be that ACL tear mechanism that we've just discussed. So there's actually a fair bit of footage available online documenting his previous rehab. So there's some interesting things to go through on there. The clip starts with him just kind of cycling on a stationary bike. It seems like it is relatively early on in his rehab process. One, just kind of based on the way he's moving. He seems to be, you know, a little bit tender, moving through this pretty gingerly, as well as the fact that he actually still has the dressings on his left knee. So this becomes really, really important one, just to start establishing a good baseline level of movement and make sure that you're getting the muscles pumping to get some of that swelling moving out. And most importantly, to make sure he is kind of working a range of motion from pretty early days, because that is one of the most important things to normalize right away. The next clip shows him doing a little bit of balance work with that locked knee brace. So you can see it's, again, we're assuming he's relatively early on in his rehab process based on the fact that he's still in a knee brace, but showing that, you know, he's doing a fair bit of unassisted work, getting some weight onto it, getting used to weight bearing in that knee with a little bit less apprehension and moving through some light balance exercises and just getting used to it all over again from there. Like super long. Next up, they have some clips of him just doing some general kind of hamstring exercises through here because once range of motion is maximized and swelling is well under control and pain is well controlled, we really focus on strengthening everything through there, bringing the quads, hamstrings, glutes, calves, everything that's going to act on that knee back up to par as far as where you want it to be from a strength perspective. And in this case, getting it to match up to that non-operated right leg for him. There is a really interesting clip right at the towards the end of the video where he's doing some balance exercises and he's moving a weight around his body and his trainer also has a phone kind of moving in front of him to do some visual tracking. This becomes really, really important as you work towards those sort of um, more like sport exercises where we need to be doing some visual tracking because there's going to come a point where you need to be focused on what's happening around you, whether that be reading a defense or just watching the play unfold in front of you rather than constantly watching that knee. So getting a little bit of that practice, even in a very, very early phase when he's doing this on his good leg becomes really, really important in terms of how that's going to translate to his later rehab once he's done with this strengthening and balance phase and can start working into a little bit more dynamic movement, change of direction, force absorption, and then slowly translating into sport specific drills from there. So the big question at this point is going to be, when will we expect to see Odell Beckham Jr. back on the football field? So with a typical ACL reconstruction surgery, we know we're looking at roughly nine to 12 months of rehab time. Typically, this is gonna involve a little bit of just settling in after the surgery, managing pain, swelling, ensuring he maximizes his range of motion in that early stage, and then going through a pretty intense form of neuromuscular um, strengthening, rehab, learning to kind of take on force through that knee again, and then practicing getting back into change of direction, jumping, landing, and football-specific drills. So keeping in mind, nine to 12 months is typical for these injuries. A lot of these pro athletes do tend to come back a little bit quicker. And with his first injury, he actually made it back in about 10 months. That being said, this being a revision surgery, we know that those second surgeries tend to be a little bit more complex. 
and as well getting psychologically prepared for a return to play after a second injury to the same knee. We would expect that to take a little bit longer this second time around. So I think he will do well with this whole rehab process, but I think it is unlikely we see him back on the field for next season. There is a small chance that he can be ready by January of next year if his team is in the playoffs. That being said, I think it is more likely that he's going to take this offseason and next to really nail down this rehab and be ready for the 2023-2024 season.